Okay, I'm recording. So we're recording to the cloud, so it should become available for those that could not actually be joining us tonight to watch another time. Absolutely. Well, welcome, everybody. Nice to be with you. Uh, I'm coming to you from beautiful Asheville, North Carolina at um, URJ Six Points Sports Academy. And um, yeah, it's 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 nice to be here and nice to be with you and to be able to be in both places at once. Um, <laughs> so welcome wherever you're you're coming from. Um, so first, we're, we you you are here because we are talking about Jewish pirates. And so, how do you know that a pirate is Jewish? Yeah. Is that a joke? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alex. I think you look like you already know. No. Joe? Not touching it. I, I think some of their tombstones have the pirate. <laughs> well, that's theme. true. That's true. I was going for something a bit more lighthearted to start us oh, off. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> than their death. But, Being too literal. You know, Joe's <laughs> mind is not in the gutter. <laughs> no, no, not in the gutter. <laughs> Uh, because they wear a yarmulke. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, um, I thought I'd start with a video clip first. I know we don't have a video video clips of a lot of Jewish pirates since piracy essentially ended, you know, at, at least a hundred years ago, if not more. Um, but we do have one video clip that I would like to share with you of a Jewish pirate. If you just bear with me, so I can share my screen. Um, so that was Captain Hook, James <laughs> Hook, as played by none other than Dustin Hoffman. So there is our Jewish pirate to start us off. <laughs> uh, so um, before we jump in, uh, um, <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Um, before we jump in, um, I have a, a, a presentation uh, to introduce you to some of the real Jewish pirates, um, as, as we know them. And um, Jeff was asking me if this was a class, you know, a subject I knew anything about before, before planning this class, and it is not. Um, so I owe everything that I, I, I'm about to share um, to the resources that I that I had. Um, and to let you know that there actually is a book on Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, um, if you are interested in this topic and want to go deeper into it, um, that that is uh, something that is open to you. And um, I'm going to share my screen once again, if it will let me. All right. If I do this, can you see the bigger presentation? All right. So, not an official pirate flag to the best of my knowledge, uh, but one that I hope sets the scene a little bit. Um, and when we think about pirates, we might think about the 1600s, 1700s, somewhere around there. But uh, if we talk about evidence of piracy within the Jewish past, uh, we actually find this very early inscription from the tomb of Jason, the high priest in Jerusalem. Um, so pre-70 of the common era, uh, which sh shows uh, two ships attacking a larger ship. And so this is, uh, from what I found, the earliest um, proof or the, the earliest reference to piracy amongst the Israelites. Um, so you can see the the remnants of, of that on, on the tomb, uh, just in, in light lines with the, um, the, the, the darker one um, it being an artist's rendering of, of what is there, what they, that is much more difficult to see. Um, so those are, are the two ships attacking the larger ship. Um, but it, it didn't stop there. So um, we have 
uh, a second era of Jewish piracy, um, according to, oops, um, which was around the time of the Jewish revolt against Rome. Um, so it, uh, around the time that the temple was destroyed, um, that the Jews were expelled from the Galilee, but and so that's in the in the north. Uh, then they they rebuilt Jaffa, which is um, just right around modern day Tel Aviv, and is on the the port. Right? It's a port city in the in the, in the Mediterranean. And the Jews were trying to resist the Roman Empire by sabotaging their commerce uh, and, and their commerce by boats. So we actually have reference from Josephus, uh, who is the, the big time historian of, of his time. And he talks about Jewish pirates operating in the area. Uh, off the coast of what we would call the land of Israel now, um, and these, this was in Roman times. And he said, and I'm trying to move <laughs> the the what I see from you um, up, up so I can actually read the quote on my screen. They they also built themselves a great many many piratical ships and turned pirates upon the seas near Syria and Phoenicia and Egypt and made those seas unnavigable to all men. Uh, we also hear that in, in the last days of the Seleucid Empire, which uh, is the, the Greek-ish empire that was fought them by the Maccabees, that uh, the Seleucids were plagued by Jewish and Arab pirates. Uh, so um, the, the Jewish pirates of the 1600s come by it honestly, uh, and, you know, 1600 years or so of, of um, examples of Jewish piracy. Um, and piracy, not just for the sake of piracy, but piracy is a way of getting back at enemies, right? Of attacking the Romans who, who the, the Jews were at war with, attack, attacking the Seleucid Empire, which of course we know that um, the Israelites and the, the Maccabees were not friendly with. So this sort of as a, as a form of, of semi-warfare or, or of sabotage, uh, economic sabotage against one's enemies um, on the high seas. So that's piracy in ancient times as we know it. Um, in the 1600s and, and then in 1700s, um, there were Jewish pirates and we'll, we'll look at a few of them. Um, and many of the, the, the ships that they captained, they named after many of the prophets. So for example, there were ships named the prophet Samuel, named the Queen Esther and the Shield of Abraham. So uh, Judaism was not just you know, their religion and piracy was sort of separate from that, but it seems like they melded the two, right? And they they somehow put their Jewish identity into uh, their seafaring ways. So um, we, we also know that they attacked Spanish fleets and allied themselves with European powers um, that for the purpose of, of ensuring the safety of, of Jewish communities and Jewish people, who were hiding from the Spanish and later the Portuguese. Um, so a, a brief history, in case you're not familiar with the Spanish Inquisition, um, the, uh, the Spanish, uh, was, they were Catholic under Ferdinand and Isabella, names you might recognize from the Christopher Columbus story. Uh, and they decided to uh, make Spain fully Catholic or Christian and uh, either expelled the, the Jews and the Muslims who were living there or forcibly converted them to Catholicism. And then they were worried about those people who had been forcibly converted, uh, reverting back to their Jewish or Muslim ways. And so they tried to search out people who were... Um, who were, who were not practicing Catholicism or were not doing so in the way that they wanted to. So they were 
quite vicious in that. Um, and so the Jews who who hid, right, either ones who were forcibly converted or those who um, who converted, you know, in in name, but but continued to practice Judaism. There are a few uh, terms for them. Uh, conversos. There are a, a more derogatory term, which is maranos, which translates to pigs. Um, it could be from the Catholic perspective. Um, and and there are a couple other names that we might see around. Um, but it but the reason why I'm going into this is because, as you'll see, many of the the Jews who turned into pirates were conversos, um, were crypto Jews, uh, were people who had been expelled or ran away from Spain and Portugal, uh, and or or um, or you know came from the the line of people who had been or who had been in hiding while still in the those areas and turned against Spain and Portugal um, as a, a form of revenge and took that revenge uh, with piracy so sort of like what the, what was going on in the Roman Empire and the Seleucid Empire we see it repeating uh, post Spanish Inquisition and the exile from Spain. So the first one I wanted to teach you about is David Abravanel. Uh, if you recognize that last name, it's because uh, he had a, a family member named Don Yitzchak Abravanel, um, who is a, a Torah commentator. So he comes from a rabbinic family. Uh, he has what the Ashkenazim would call Yichus. Um, and his family uh, was massacred off the coast of South America. Um, and uh, as a response to that, he he took over a, a ship, at, which was named Jerusalem, and he took on the name Captain Davis. Uh, and then he, with that ship, he began to attack Spanish ships um, that were along the Pacific coast in Panama. Uh, didn't hurt that they had a lot of treasure on them, uh, I'm sure. But um, his his goal was to make trouble for the Spanish uh, and, and to do so in this ship called Jerusalem. So he actually was, was successful in getting the Spanish to fight a two-front naval war um against British pirates, presumably not Jewish, um, but also Jewish pirate allies, both in the Pacific and the Atlantic. So he was able to spread the Spanish thin uh, and make them more vulnerable and and their economics more stressed um, by having them fight in, in these these two areas. Um, and, and did so by forming alliances and um, by, by gathering people together as a form of, of getting back at the Spanish. So I think as we go through this, what, when, what you'll see is that this is actually part of the Sephardic Jewish story um, and is a, a response to what was going on to the Sephardic Jews um, who had been in Spain for centuries in relative... Um, prosperity and peace and comfort, and then uh, along came the Reconquista, right, right, where the Catholics took Spain over from uh, the Muslims, and uh, and the Inquisition that followed. So all of a sudden, the Golden Age of Spain was no more, um, and so we we see these uh, these Jews that are getting dispersed all over the world uh, as they knew it. Uh, and and turning against those imperial powers that were trying to take that world over and and uh, profit from doing so. So another one is Sinan Rice. Uh, we see a engraving of him here. Uh, anything that you notice that that you would like to mention? Of, of seen on rice at, at this moment. Feel free to unmute and shout it out. 
Sinan is a Turkish name, isn't it? Uh huh. Uh, well, I don't know that, but I, um, Jack is is nodding his head yes. So I I believe the two of you, and that makes sense because that is where he landed in the Ottoman Empire. Um, you may notice his large turban. Right. So not we're not talking about uh, Brazil or Jamaica or the Gulf Coast. So he was still um, in, the, in the Mediterranean area, uh, somewhere around there. And he um, born before the year 1533, just to give you a sense of, of when we are talking. And uh, when was the the expulsion from Spain? Anyone? Anyone? 1492. Okay, 1492, which should be a uh, an important date, uh, especially around the idea of seafaring, right, um, and exploration of the New World. Um, so a big year in Spain. Uh, so Sinan Rice, not long, born not long after that. Um, so he was from a Sephardic family that fled this time to the Ottoman Empire, not to South America. Uh, and he uh, fought against Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, both, out of Santorini. So that's where he was situated. Uh, he became so prolific in his, in his fighting um, that he earned the term uh, or the, the name the Great Jew. Um, so there's no, uh, no doubt about his, his Jewishness or um, or where he sat in the minds of the Spanish or um, I guess the, the, the Catholic Empire at that time. Uh, he uh, became very high up and, and worked with the feared pirate Barbosa. Um, he ended up in, in the Ottoman uh, Navy becoming supreme commander uh, and commanded 6,000 6, troops uh, out of Libya. So he was kind of hopping all over the place and making trouble for, especially for Spain, uh, the whole way through. And again, as, as we'll see with some of these, um, in some ways they are privateers, they're in business for themselves and they are working outside of, um, of official authority. Uh, and then sometimes they are sort of brought in to to enemies of Spain uh, because of their prowess and um, and get official titles like Supreme Commander, uh, get sort of a stamp of approval for for their activities. Uh, so we'll see that a few different times as we go through this. Um, that was seen on rice. And now we get to a, a one is, that is beloved to me, which is the pirate rabbi. Maybe after this class, you know, I might earn that title. I don't know. Um, but his real name was, um, and somebody who um, is better at languages than me can pronounce the last the last name. Uh, but as I read it, Rabbi Samuel Palache, Palache. Um, so he was from from the late fifteen hundreds into sixteen sixteen to give you a sense of where we are on that timeline. Um, so his ancestors, also of uh, a, a Sephardic uh, rabbinic family, his ancestors fled to Morocco during the Reconquista when the, when the um, Catholics were taking over Spain. And again, he came from a family of rabbis, and he was one himself. Uh, and he uh, allied himself with the Dutch, with the, with the Netherlands, and he was a traitor between the Netherlands and Morocco. Um, and then also began some privateering as, as part of that, um, that seafaring. Um, so some it seems legitimate uh, and legal, some not so legitimate and legal, um, a little bit of each. Um, so I, I, one reason I like this is because you know, we, we of course, when we think of pirates, we think of outlaws. We think of you know maybe the uh, um, 
you know, people who are getting by just uh, by by what they can do. They have no other options, right? They are the um, the, the dregs of society, right? We have you know, maybe in mind those movies where they're trying to get some sailors on board and they you know get them out of jail and they get them out of you know every single place they can get them. You know, this is their um, the last the last thing because of how dangerous it was to to be a pirate and to be on out, out at sea at this time um but we have the, an example of this one who's a rabbi right who comes from a, a rabbinic family uh and has some some status right who um who maybe could have been doing something else and so it makes me wonder why did this one turn to piracy? Why was this what what he decided was his role in life? And um, we, we, though you know he's not around to ask him, my my assumption is that again it was revenge. It was feeling like um, the, the Spanish were so uh, evil to to the Jews that they had this coming, and that maybe. Uh, it was even a a holy thing. It was a mitzvah to to attack the Spanish in this way and to sabotage them, um, to, to fight against um, the the Inquisition and to fight against what they were doing to, to the Jews. That's my guess. Um, I don't know, but um, that that's kind of what I think about when when I was reading through um, about his life. Um, I'll pause here, see if there are any questions or reactions or uh, anything people would like to add. Again, I do not uh, purport to be the expert in this or or even this time period. A lot of this is new information to me that I'm excited to share with you, but I, I do not have uh, all of the, the answers. Uh, Larry. Um, do we know who painted this? It looks sort of like, you know, like the Dutch golden age of painting, Rembrandt yeah. or something. Yeah, I, I believe it is the, the, the school of Rembrandt. I, I When I found it, it, it wasn't clear to me if it was Rembrandt or if it was just the, the school of, uh, but it is, yeah, in that, in that time period and in that vein. That is probably easily Googleable, I would imagine. <laughs> of Rabbi Samuel Palace Rembrandt. Again, with the turban, right? He's coming out of Morocco. I can't see the chat. So if any if anything pops up, do you feel free to unmute and, and let me know what I'm missing. All right, this is a big one, um, and those who speak Portuguese, perhaps you can uh, <laughs> help me with the pronunciation, but uh, Moses Cohen Henriquez, uh, born 1595, so the, the, name, the name Moses Cohen should uh, be an indicator of his, his Jewishness, uh, so he was born to a Sephardic family that had been forcibly converted um and yeah joe enriquez is a very common sparty sparty uh, uh name yes great thank you <laughs> um so they moved to the netherlands which seems to be a a safe place for at least for a time for many of these these jews who were escaping from spain and portugal uh, so his family moved to the Netherlands where they returned back to their Jewish practice and belief. Uh, so the forced conversion did not stick. And when, when there, he joined the Dutch Navy and uh, he eventually rose high up in the ranks there. Um, he didn't stay, though, in the Netherlands. He went across the Atlantic to Brazil and while he was there, he was a spy against the Portuguese. Again, so Spain, Portugal, right? The Iberian Peninsula, both Spain and Portugal had their own expulsions and inquisitions. Even though we talk more about the Spanish Inquisition, uh, there was a Portuguese one and it was also quite fierce. 
Um, so let's not forget the Portuguese <laughs> and their role in this. Um, so he was pretty successful and, in, and um, settled for a while in Brazil, but then the Portuguese took it over and then it was no longer for him to be there. Um, so uh, he went into piracy uh, at this point. So he had been in the Navy, right? He had been legit. And then when uh, some doors closed for him and for his family and his community, uh, he turned to piracy. And uh, he actually was, was serving alongside Henry Morgan, Captain Morgan, for those uh, rum fans. And uh, so he was perhaps the fiercest uh, pirate of his time, Henry Morgan, and, and uh, Enriquez was, from what I understand, his right-hand man for a period of time. And he operated out of Front Royal in Jamaica, which uh, was known as the wickedest place on earth. Right? That's, this was a, a center for piracy. Um, and so that this, this, this was where he was hanging out and who he was hanging out with. Um, so he has his pirate bona fides, you know, he, he has his passport stamped as, as full on pirate here. Um, so after being with Captain Morgan for a while, he became a pirate himself. He went into business himself and uh, actually created his own pirate island off the coast of Brazil. Uh, so this was after after his time in in Jamaica. So he went from Brazil, from the Netherlands to Brazil to Jamaica back to Brazil, uh, and he became a ruler of, of this pirate island. Um, one of his most lauded feats is that uh, there was a Spanish treasure fleet that was sailing uh, off of. Cuba's Bay of Mantanza, Mantanzas in 1628 that he was able to uh, to take over. And the amount of gold and silver bullion that you see there worth, if we translated it today, over a billion dollars. So a big is embarrassment for Spain and a big uh, chunk out of, uh, out of their economy uh, that they were... Uh, you know, taking from the new world, pilfering from the new world. Uh, so he was in that way quite successful in his revenge against the inquisitors. And the inquisitors were searching for him for quite a while, for many years, and he was able to evade them, uh, right? When, when Brazil was taken over, he was able to run to Jamaica, and then he was able to run off the coast of Brazil and, and um, was never caught by the inquisitors. Um, and eventually, uh, when the British took over Jamaica, he went back there, and that's where he settled, and he was actually able to help establish the Jewish community there. Um, and from what I was reading, um, around this time, there were, it was quite a large Jewish community in Jamaica, uh, at some point maybe up to 20% of the population. Uh, and because it was safe from the inquisitors, right? That under the English, there was relative religious freedom, and and they could be Jews and, and they could be somewhat secure. Uh, so Jamaica was actually a, a safe place for for the Jews for a, a good chunk of time, while the the British were were ruling over it. Yeah, Joe. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but uh, it is reputed that. Jewish conversos were amongst those that helped the British take the island from the Spanish, uh, you know, let them in and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I guess now I was reading a little bit that, that um, you know, the, the Jamaican government has kind of um, grown uh, keen to to this as, as a, you know, potential tourist boon. Uh, right of uh, you know talking about certainly the the pirate past of which, which is attractive to many people, but also um, it's become a, a place for for Jewish tourism, right? To look at the old synagogue and and the cemeteries that we'll, we'll get a little taste of 
of what that looks like um, and talking about the Jewish history of Jamaica and, and what it, what the Jewish community was like back then there. Um, and so it's actually become a tourist destination for Jews who are interested in, in Jewish tourism. Um, I don't know if anyone's been. Has anyone been to Jamaica? Yeah, Joe? I was posted there. I was there yeah. for three years. Oh, tell me. Okay, so um, were you able to see some of these Jewish sites and hear yeah. some of the stories? The, the, the synagogue is beautiful. It's Sephardi style synagogue with sand floors. Uh -huh. And they they say that they have sand floors for two reasons. One is uh, to as a reminder of the 40 years in the desert. Uh -huh. And the other is that it, it would mask the sound of feet when people used to pray in secret in Spain, um, they would have sand floors to so that nobody would hear people moving around inside. Okay. And I didn't um, there were a lot of people. Um, I mean, the community had there's a lot of Ashkenazi people who would come in the 19th century, but you have a lot of Jamaicans who acknowledge Jewish roots with names like Pinto. Um, and Enriquez and others like that. In fact, there was a Bishop Cohen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there were names that one would recognize as having Jewish roots, although the people today were, were no longer Jewish. But it was a very warm, very welcoming community. And uh, yeah, it was really, that was an interesting part of that assignment. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, Jack, I think I saw him. Yeah, there's um, my son's in-laws have cousins. Uh, the family had come from Jamaica, who, cousins who were Jamaican Jews going back, and um, the and they um, were involved in in restoring some of the the Jewish cemeteries in Jamaica. And uh, there's there's quite a bit of stuff on on the web about the Jews of Jamaica that can be found. Mm -hmm. Some with a history of piracy. Yes, that's where they have the tombstones with the pirate signals uh, symbols on them. Right, like these. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here is a tombstone from uh, one of those old cemeteries in Jamaica, and you can see the Hebrew inscription, uh, as well as the skull and crossbones, right, indicating um, that this person was both Jewish and a pirate. Um, so uh, from my understanding, there's about 50 of these in, in, in these old Jewish cemeteries that, that one can see. Um, so not a one-off, right? This is uh, something that, that, at least for a time, was was somewhat common, right? Um, so not an aberration. Yaakov Kuriel, um, born to a Jewish family and converted to Christianity, Christianity under pressure from the Inquisition. Um, but he was actually in, uh, in the Spanish fleet. So uh, he was caught by the Inquisition, which ended his naval career uh, in Spain. Uh, but when he was caught, he was actually freed by uh, by sailors, by his sailors, right? Who were actually many of them were conversos or moranos uh, is the term that I found in this, in these articles. Um, so he was known, right, by to have had this this Jewish family and perhaps was even practicing Judaism and had some camaraderie with others who were in the same uh, boat <laughs> as he was as it were. Um, so they freed him from, from captivity in, in a very daring way. And so from that point on, right, no longer in the Spanish Navy, uh, he decided to take revenge against the Spanish. Uh, and so he actually sailed with three ships under his command, um, taking his revenge. Um, it's, this, this might be apocryphal, but um, some accounts say that he retired eventually and went to the land of Israel to study Torah and Kabbalah, and he actually died in the land of Israel after his piracy days. Um, that, that it seems there wasn't a lot of uh, historical documentation about, but that, that is the lore around Yaakov Koriel. Um, but I love this uh, that, you know, here he is, you know, just sitting in a jail cell 
uh, awaiting his fate from the Spanish Inquisition when all of a sudden all these um, crypto Jews come to his rescue and and uh, and that's the beginning of Yaakov Curiel the pirate. Um, you know, the, I, I think it's a nice story. <laughs> I think that that's a movie waiting to be made, if you ask me. Um, the the last one that I want to share, um, and this is the most recent. So piracy, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, ended mostly around in the 1600s. And that was where, really when it was at its peak. So Jean Lafitte was uh, well after that, right? born 1780, died 1823. And you may notice from his name, is not of Spanish or Portuguese origin, um, but uh, uh, was French. Um, so he, there are a few different accounts of where he was born. I think in his journal, he said he was born in the Bordeaux region. Um, but uh, this is a, someone who was not just a pirate, but, but certainly was for a period of time. So he primarily operated in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and again, this is you know early on in um, the existence of the United States. Uh, so he and his brother Pierre were smugglers uh, and they um, made a living doing that. And then uh, they were sort of in Louisiana and then moved off the coast of Louisiana uh, uh, to, I think when, when they were, um, people were searching for them or, you know, when the, when, when the fire was on with them. So they moved off the coast so they would have a bit more freedom. And that's when they really started engaging in piracy when they were off the coast. Um, and so he did that for, for a period of time until the war of 1812. Uh, so he was known for his prowess at sea and for his ability to evade and attack. And so Andrew Jackson uh, came to him and asked for help uh, and in, in exchange for a legal pardon for his illegal activities. So Lafitte took this deal, um, his, his freedom, to, to help Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812, and was successful in that. Um, that didn't end his piracy though. <laughs> you would think, okay, you get you get a get out of jail free card, maybe you decide to change your ways, but not so with Jean Lafitte. He returned to piracy after the war, um, and he actually established a pirate community on Galveston Island. Uh, so I believe like any French speakers can help me, but Campeche, Campeche, I don't know what that, that how do you pronounce that name? It's also Spanish, Campeche, but oh, I, don't know, I don't know if it was meant to be a French word, which is possible, but Campeche is the name of a state in Southern Mexico, or ah, Gulf okay. of Mexico. Okay. So, maybe Campeche. That came from. Um, so he established this pirate community right after um, that what we think about as the parts of the Caribbean had, had really it died down at this point, but he still uh, became a leader uh, of, of this group. Um, in 1821, his ship is ambushed by the Spanish uh, and he's captured, he's jailed, uh, but sort of like with Jacob Curiel, he managed to escape with outside help. Um, so again, the, the Spanish are thwarted uh, in their attempt to to uh, get rid of the pesky pirates who are attacking their ships. Although he was captured again in 1822 by an American warship, um, they turned him over to the authorities and they freed him. They said, okay, you can go. Um, perhaps because of what he had done in the war and, and this legal pardon that he had gotten from Andrew Jackson. Um, so he has a journal, and there's some debate as to the historical accuracy of the journal, but I wanted to share what was in there. And that is, um, you know, we, we, we've sort of established that he was a pirate, but not yet that he's Jewish. So, so he claims that his maternal grandfather was a Sephardi Jew, a Spanish Jew, 
Um, and his maternal grandfather, the same person, was executed by the Inquisition for Judaizing. Right? For uh, maybe sort of reconverting people or get, getting them back into Judaism or associating themselves, right? Uh, with with Jewish practice, so he 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 says his maternal grandfather was caught by the inquisitors for this, and th these are quotes from his journal that I I loved and I wanted to share. Um, I owe all my ingenuity to the great intuition of my Jewish Spanish grandmother, who was a witness at the time of the Inquisition. Grandmother's teachings inspired in me a hatred of the Spanish crown and all the persecutions for which it was responsible, not only against the Jews. Um, so very strong words from Jean Lafitte about, on his feelings of uh, against the Spanish. And I think really also encapsulates what we've seen, right, with all the other examples, um, although they haven't stated it explicitly why they were engaging in piracy, right, that a lot of it did stem from the hatred of the Spanish empire in Portuguese and um, the ways that they had really decimated the Jewish community in those places and and still, you know, even once people escaped, had made the world a, an unsafe place to be Jewish. Um, and so they wanted to exact revenge, right? They wanted to, um, to show those Spanish and to give them the what for. Um, and so they did that, right, by attacking their vessels, by attacking the the economic machine um, that was their the, the, their navy um, and doing what they could to to undo the power of the Spanish and to lift up other European powers and others who who would fight against the Spanish. So, this is Jean Lafitte National Historical Park and Preserve in Louisiana. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of fascinating that this guy who was clearly a pirate and an outlaw, um, also a war hero. Uh, so what do you do with somebody with a mixed past, right? Or you, you give him a, a national historical park and preserve. Um, so, you know, I, and I think we've seen this a few times, right? There were, many of them were war heroes, right? They had official postings and they also had this, other side uh, of what they were doing. And so it wasn't just outlaws, right? It wasn't just people who were attacking any vessel they could get their hands on. Um, but they were, maybe they got their skills from their military service and then used them in other ways, or maybe they, they went in and out of it. Um, so it's sort of a fascinating, you know, we kind of think of, of it as, you know, two-sided, like, you know, the, the, the Navy is over here and the pirates are over here and they're fighting each other. But in, in some instances, they were one of the same. Um, so, you know, I just thought it was fascinating that this guy um, gets some official respect from, from the U.S. government, uh, the Park Service. Um, yeah, Joe. Oh, you're muted. Joe. Wait, you're muted again. Goodness. Okay, yeah. now, yes. Jean Lafitte is a very popular figure in New Orleans culture, and um, the oldest gay bar in New Orleans is called Lafitte in Exile. Really? Yeah. Oh, I had no idea. Oh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Fantastic, all right. See, as somebody who has never been to Louisiana, I was completely uh, unaware of all of that. Yeah, I went to law school there. In fact, he's reputed to have buried treasure in the, in the, in the bayous somewhere, but it's never been found. All right, we'll, take, we'll make a synagogue trip. <laughs> we'll hit up Bourbon Street, you know, we'll <laughs> do a little service in the Ninth Ward and, and we'll find some treasure. Um, so related to to this um, and the fact that he is, you know, such a big figure, um, officially and unofficially, um, 
it brings to mind for me, you know, this question of, you know, are the, are these people to be celebrated? Um, are these people that we as Jews should be proud of um, because they were attacking the inquisitors in the Spanish because they were um, you know, doing so proudly as Jews and, and openly? Is this something that we want to kind of put on the down low and, and not celebrate because they were probably breaking some commandments in, in doing that. Um, you know, how, how are we feeling about the fact that, that we have these, these grand examples of, of Jewish pirates out there? I think it's just like the Maccabees. Mm. You know, that's fighting for what they believed in, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> and, you know, the rabbis obviously had issues with the Maccabees periodically, so... You can't imagine they wouldn't have had issues with pirates, but if we can celebrate the Maccabees, why can't we celebrate the pirates? Yeah. And look, we have many examples from the Torah of people without institutional power using what they do have to bring justice to the world, right? Um, if we think about the story of Judah and Tamar, where it's, you know, Tamar is... Um, J Judah is withholding his sons who are owed to Tamar so that she can have children and uh, security. Um, she um, pretends to be a, a prostitute in, in order to get Judah to, to make her pregnant. And um, so she kind of goes outside the bounds in order to bring justice to the world. And she is really um, you know, so in the right at the end of the story. Um and, and there, are, there are many examples from the Tanakh of, of people, especially women who don't have a lot of power in certain situations, who um, go outside the bounds of what's expected of them. And and it, within the story them itself in the Tanakh, it, it shows them to be in the right. And so maybe this is an extension of that. Um, you know, that, that the, these people were exiled for or expelled from where they were. They were under threat um, of, of torture and death. And um, they were doing what they could to right the wrongs that their people were facing. So I want to introduce a, a rabbinic idea uh, from the Talmud, which is mitzvah haba'ah ba'avera. So mitzvah, commandment, that comes by way of a sin, right? Avera, it's like a wrongdoing or the sin. So the question that the rabbis ask is, can you fulfill a mitzvah by breaking a command, right? can, by breaking a mitzvah? Can you sin in order to do a mitzvah? And is that mitzvah then considered valid? So there's a whole convoluted argument in in the Talmud and later rabbinic works about if it's something that is possible, if it's not possible. We don't really need to get into the specifics of that. But this came to mind when I was thinking about the pirates and what they were doing against Spain. And also the fact that they were probably breaking some commandments in doing so. Right. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Um, come to mind. So is this an example of a mitzvah coming about by way of breaking other mitzvot, right? Bringing justice to the world by breaking commandments? Or is this, you know, is that an apologetic for, for what was going on? Joe? No, I think it's sort of in, in some ways both. You gave a few examples where the pirates used their ill-gotten gains to help their local Jewish communities. And that would be where you're, they're fulfilling a commandment by breaking another. But those who were just out to enrich themselves, more like the 20th century Jewish criminals like Meyer Lansky, um, you know, they were just in it for the, to, that's a way to make money, a, a, an yeah. illegal way to make money. And yeah. they, I, I, you know, so it's sort of, you have two different streams going on here. Right. Well, and you have examples of people who have gotten money in illegal ways in, in current, you know, in, in our times that sort of try to cleanse themselves by 
funding Jewish communities and Jewish institutions, right? I, when I was in Los Angeles, I, I regularly drove by Milken Jewish Day School named after Michael Milken, uh, who got his money in, in not so good ways, right? Um, and sort of tried to cleanse his name by donating large amounts to the Jewish community. Um, so as an example, right, if we think about um, those who established Jewish communities, were they doing so um, you know, out of the goodness of their heart because Jewish communities were decimated in Spain and Portugal and they needed a place for Jews to be? Or were they trying to you know, say, yes, I was a pirate and I got all this money, but now I'm going to give some to the, the Jews so that they'll you know, kind of welcome me back. They're not around to ask. Hey, Joe. Well, I think in some ways, um, the situations are not 100% the same in that, you know, those, as you say, those communities were decimated and struggling to even get on their feet. The Jewish community of Los Angeles did they need that other day school? Could they have gotten that other day school other way? You know, one is sort of, yes, trying to rehabilitate his his reputation. Um, the, but the, the first instance, you've got people, he's help, they were helping people who were really were in extremis and uh, might not have survived otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Larry, I saw a hand. Um, the, I believe at the GW campus here in Washington, the School of Public Health is the Milken School of Public Health. Uh, but but what came to my mind was Paula Vogel's play Indecent, which is about Sholem Ash's play God of Vengeance, where a man who runs a whorehouse uh, commissions a Torah scroll to try to buy legitimacy for himself and and his family. Uh, mm -hmm. But it does not end well. Hmm. Other takes? Well, is, uh, is there a hierarchy of meets vote that if you do one that's better than the one that you did that wasn't good, do you, does it offset? I mean, you just. Well, there are three that you are not allowed to break no matter what, <laughs> right? Um, incest, uh, idolatry, and, and murder. So in, in that way, yes, there is sort of a hierarchy um, to the mitzvot and you might, you know, the big 10 are certainly there. And then later on you, uh, mitzvot that come from the Tanakh, or from the Torah, uh, have primacy over mitzvot that come from the rabbis. So there's like, deoraita means like from the, uh, that, that which is from the oral law from the Torah. And then you have de Rabbanan, which is a, a mitzvah from the rabbis. And whenever there's a conflict or something between the two, the mitzvah de Rabbanan uh, goes by the wayside. The one that's it's from the rabbis um, is of lesser status. Uh, but I, I assume some of these pirates were engaging in, let's call it killing. I don't know if, you know, if, if you consider it warfare, it's not really murder, um, you know, maybe in, in their eyes and, in the eyes of the law, depending, but you know, there was perhaps murder going on. <laughs> I don't know the specifics of it, but so it seems like they're breaking some big meets vote, right? I mean, at least one of the big ten by thou shalt, thou shalt not steal, even from evil empires, right? It doesn't give a little exception, you know, except you can steal from your enemies, that's fine. Um, although, you know, in, in war, you are allowed to take things. Now, there are rules around that in the Torah and later on texts. But maybe they, they saw it not as just stealing, but as being at war with a large empire. You know, they, you know me with my three little ships against the Spanish Armada. Um, but, you know, it's not just me stealing from anyone I can get my hands on. Alex? Yeah, I mean, there's a part of me that feels like there's some attempts at tikkun olam, maybe clumsy and maybe pre-modern. Um, but, you know, 
the the I'm thinking more, you know, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and uh, Princess Leia as a, you know, a hardy band of basically space pirates. I mean, you know, Han Solo was a pirate. Um, so there's a part of me that feels like um, in the service of a cause of freedom. Now, did they profit? Did they profiteer? Sure. You know, Boeing profiteers. Honeywell profiteers, you know, it happens. Um, but um, I'm inclined to view them, certainly not with any kind of, you know, really uh, serious disdain or, or, or anger or judge, because, you know, you do what you can with the tools you have in the moment. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I, I have to say, I'm like, I, I feel when I was looking through these, I was about, like a little proud. I'm like, yeah, Moses Cohen Henriquez like got a billion dollars from from the Spanish. Go him, right? Um, and you know, he was able to finance the the Jewish community in Jamaica. Great, you know, how cool is that? Um, so that's that's sort of how I'm feeling. But I, I don't know if I should be a bit more conflicted about it. Um, you know, I think also, you know generally in society um piracy is um cleansed right and made to be like fun for kids <laughs> when it was you know a, a very serious and violent and probably awful way to live um so I, you know i i think I, I i'm wary you know that i'm also coming from that mentality of you know that we have you know, talk like a pirate day and you can dress up like a, a pirate and uh, go trick-or-treating and um, that the reality of, of piracy was quite different than, than that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, I should take that into account more. Alfredo? Yeah, so for me, you know, taking a broader view of it, I mean, piracy, I think, in all these time periods was what was happening across the world, right? And why not have Jewish pirates, right? I mean, it's just like, it, it, it would be the case that you would have them. What makes it more interesting to me about Jewish pirates is perhaps what drove them to be pirates, right? What was the reasons for doing it? Not that that makes it better or that, or that that is sort of more defensible, but to me, that's the really interesting part of it uh, because I thought I knew a lot about the Inquisition and conversos, but I didn't know this part yeah. <laughs> that they were converso uh, pirates and and what drove them to do it. So it definitely is a movie or multiple movies in the making. So yeah, I I think for me the big aha thing was putting in the in the context of the Sephardic Jewish story, right? And where we are talking on the timeline where we're talking about with the Inquisition. Uh, and that this was a Jewish response to the Inquisitors and to the expulsion. And this was a way to fight against what they saw as that evil empire um, that kicked them out of what had been home for quite a while. Uh, um, and, and so putting it in that context, uh, um, I, I liked that. <laughs> and it gave me a bit more insight into some of the responses that that happened, not just fleeing, right, which which many do, and, and not hiding one's one's Judaism, which was a, a valid response. I don't want to uh, poo poo that as a means of survival, um, but as another response that that was going on for the the Jews who had to leave Spain and Portugal um, and their descendants, and that this was a way, you know, generations later even. Of of fighting back against against um, you know, Catholic supremacy and um, you know, the, the the way that that they looked at Jews. Well, they couldn't all be Kabbalists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Larry. Um. So uh, two things. Number one, I read someplace once that the the Sultan, the head of the Ottoman Empire in 1492, sent a fleet of ships to pick up Jews from Spain to bring them to Turkey, which mm -hmm. is by calling an Uber, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the other thing is that there's an, there's, although I hesitate to use this word, there's an in, intersectionality piece of this is, which is there's been some things written, I think, about gay pirates. So I wonder if any of these were gay Jewish pirates. I was trying, I was looking for, <laughs> I didn't find anything that said that. So um, I, I have no um, historical documentation to add, but it was definitely on my mind, but as I was reading. Yeah, Joe. I think one one reason that it's kind of fun hearing reading about Jewish pirates is, you know, the stereotype is the timid Jew, the, the bookish Jew, and the idea of a swaggering pirate Jew is, is so different and kind of fun. And so in a sense, in, in that sense, it's appealing. Yeah, you would think- Even I though mean, they were the, outlaws. You know, the, the, um, the Sabra lore, right? The, the Israeli, the new Jew, right? Working the land and fighting. And, you know, they you would think that Israeli society would have also taken on like the Jewish pirates as, as they've taken on the Maccabees, right? As fighting against the, the evil empire. Um, so, you know, somebody should get on that in, in Israel to add to that uh, strong Jew uh, uh, lore that, that is there. Larry. Um, it must have been hard for pirates to lay tefillin if they had a hook on one hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what? They wouldn't need a separate yard to read Torah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, th the other piece of the um, sin to, com you know, committing a sin to save some, it's, it's, it's a lot like Robin Hood. And Robin Hood has certainly had a lot of, uh, you know, Errol Flynn can be all of those people. <laughs> Robin Hood and pirates and mm -hmm. he was everybody. Good. Well, thank you for sailing these seas with me this evening. Um, you know, for me, as I was researching this, it, it went a little bit, deeper and more interesting than initially I thought it just thinking about the topic um, would be, um, you know, in, in placing it in Jewish history and, um, and really thinking about the, this is a potentially valid response and, and what it means to uh, make things right, even if it means breaking a few rules. Um, we've been known to break a few rules here and there to bring justice to the world. So uh, maybe this can inspire us a little bit to uh, to bring some justice where, where justice needs to happen. Could you share your resources? Uh, yeah, I can share them. It's a lot of different websites that I was looking at, a lot of different articles. I think a lot of them probably based their stuff on the, um, on the book. Um, let me see if I can find the author I, I forget his name but he, he would probably be the the main one to or the the, the one where it, it's all sort of compiled um so let's see this is let me I'll share my screen just so you can see what it looks like I think I might actually have the book somewhere um if anyone is interested and really wants to borrow it um is this it let's see Yes, so Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, how a generation of swashbuckling Jews carved out an empire in the new world in their quest for treasure, religious freedom, and revenge. That's from 09 by Edward Fritzler. So a lot of articles that I was reading were, were also quoting him. Um, I haven't seen what his sources are, um, but I think he's the, the go-to place uh, if you want to read more about it. Thank you, Rabbi Jake. That's sure great. My pleasure. Thank you, Yashikoth. Yashikoth, that's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining Thank me. You. Thank you very much. Ruth, Thank you. This will be a, this will 
This will be available on the web if you want to tell your uh, friends about it. Thank you, Jack. And this was very interesting. Karen. I will. Uh, Alex, do you want to uh, talk about your reading tomorrow? I could do that. Um, I've been in a uh, writing cohort run by Witcherwell Well for the last several years. And our end of the year celebration is tomorrow night at which um, uh, almost all of us, I think, are uh, gonna be re 